Hello everyone, today I'm going to be doing something a bit more relaxing and uh, I'm going to talk to you about contemporary Korean fiction, I guess will be the proper way to talk about it. And I've got a whole bunch of these. I'm not going to talk about everything, obviously, because I also have some audiobook versions and stuff like that. But I kind of wanted to do something a bit lighter. Usually when it's the time of the holidays like it is now, I kind of become you know, pretty hard on you and uh, and tell people to work and all that. And I, th I figured I'd do something a bit more relaxing. I've been reading quite a bit of uh, Korean uh, fiction lately, and I thought it'd be interesting to talk about because it doesn't get talked about much. And I think it's a very interesting genre. First of all, a couple of disclaimers, I should say. First of all, I'm not Korean. I just have an interest in it. I don't, my level of Korean is probably elementary school or lower than elementary school. It's, um, you know, I, I can read the alphabet and understand very minimal stuff. I lived there for a while, like a long time ago, and I was working there for a bit for two years and I had a private tutor. I pretty much forgotten most of the stuff. So obviously everything I'm reading is in translation. Second of all, I'm not going to be talking about any Korean drama. I'm not interested. I'm like the only person in the world who is not interested in Korean drama. I'm not interested in K-pop either. Or K-pop I'm interested in if it's between like 98 and 2002 because that's when I was there off and on. If you want to talk about K-pop during that time, that's fine, but otherwise I don't care. So anyway, I'm going to talk about this. And if you have other requests for other types of books to be talking about, feel free to let me know. We can do uh, contemporary, I don't know, you know, here I have Korean. We can do Taiwanese. I have a lot, Italian. Uh, maybe French, Japanese, uh, I don't know, and then other stuff, biographies, uh, business books, anything having to do with linguistics, historical fiction, pretty much anything except, except I'm not into sci-fi and young adult, really. Let's get into this. I wasn't really sure in what order to do this, um, so I'm just going to do the order that I feel like doing it in because, once again, it's my channel, so I get to do what I want. Um, first, oh, actually, first of all, so this wins the prize for the best cover. Uh, I really only bought this when I bought it because of this cover. The book was okay, uh, but I'm glad that because uh, it got me into uh, Kim Yong-ha, Yong-ha Kim, and it got me into a couple of other books, and then I ended up reading this book by him, which I like quite a bit, so I should go into this a bit more. These are a couple short stories. They're mostly depressing, as you can probably tell by that. But they're a bit weird. They're, they have this noir aspect to them. The cover is probably the best part of this. Oh, actually. Uh, just one second. So actually, I uh, since I'm doing this, I should probably be wearing this. That says Ocean. Actually, it says Ocean. That's my nickname, in case you didn't know. Um, it, it doesn't say Ocean. It just says the sound Ocean. So I'm gonna actually I'm not gonna wear this because I feel like I look ridiculous. Let's get into this. Young Ha Kim. Uh, one of the short stories, the main one, I have the right to destroy myself, talks about a, a person who helps others commit suicide. It was kind of pretty depressed, though. This was a bit more interesting. I mean, it was pretty depressing in and of itself, but it had all these aspects and these ties, I think, to Christianity and stuff like that. I, um, I enjoyed this a bit more. He is kind of a depressing guy, uh, Young Ha Kim. He, um, uh, I remember reading is, what's it called? An anti-natalist, I think it's called. People who don't want, think there's too much suffering in the world, and so he decided he doesn't want to have any kids because he doesn't want to bring any more kids into this suffering world. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea. And actually, that's a good segue to talk about Korean literature. For a long time, I kind of tried to avoid Korean literature because I felt like it was really depressing. They have this uh, feeling of Han. If you look up Han, what it means, then you'll probably get a better definition, but basically means this suffering that continues over generations and that's, that Koreans have, basically. And, you know, it, it kind of gets you down. <laughs> Many of the books do have that aspect, but I generally don't like depressing things. Even if they are masterpieces, I don't like them. Uh, I like to... Uh, read happy stuff. So the fact that I'm reading all this stuff is probably a good indication that it's pretty good or that I enjoyed it quite a bit, even if some of it can be quite depressing. Anyway, so that's Yong Ha Kim. Let's get on, let's get on with this a bit more. Uh, here, let's, let's cover someone everyone knows, uh, Han Kang. This, she's probably the most famous Korean uh, writer today. Um, I also read, my favorite book of hers, by the way, is Human Acts, which I don't have here. I think it's in Taiwan. That one, it talks about the uprising in Gwangju, uh, but it's very interesting. It's one of those that kind of puts you into it rather than, you know, like A Tale of Two Cities puts you into uh, the French Revolution and how, how it was to live through that. You'll get a lot more of life living through the French Revolution through reading that than any history book. And the same thing, I think, with Human Acts, talking about the Kwanju uprising. It's all, it's all written in the second person singular, which I thought was very interesting as well. Um, and anyway, The Vegetarian was the first one I read. I think first one most people read by Hong Kong. And I remember in Italy, it was huge too as well. 
so I, I won't say too much more about her because chances are you've either heard about her or, um, or you can find out a lot more about her. She won, yeah, the Man Booker International Prize in 2016. So let's use that to segue into another one that's long listed for the Man Booker International Prize for 2019, and that's At Dusk by Hwan Sok Young. Translated by, they don't even say who the translator is here, Sora Kim Russell. I'm pretty sure it's Sora Kim. Yeah, Sora Kim Russell. By the way, and so all these are translated, so you, you know, sometimes the translator, some translators are better than others, let's say. Anything translated by Sora Kim Russell is excellent. I, um, I highly recommend anything translated by her because it's a serious book and it will be translated very well. There are a couple translators who are good. Um, as we get into them, I, I can bring them up. But uh, yeah, Sora Kim Russell, you can never go wrong. So this is by Hwang Sook Young. So Hwan Sook Young wrote this book. He also wrote another book that uh, I, I, read, um, I read in digital format uh, called Familiar Things, I believe it's called. Anyway, he's an interesting guy. He was actually born in Manchuria, uh, what was then called Manchukuo. And then he came back down to Korea. He fought in the Vietnam War, I think. And uh, the way he categorized Korea is, is that it's in a perpetual state of homelessness, both literal and figurative in the sense that since the two Koreas have split up, um, you know, the Koreans, they're kind of disoriented because their country isn't a country anymore and it's two countries and stuff like that. These books, so this one that uh, At Dusk and Familiar Things, I actually think I enjoyed Familiar Things a bit more than At Dusk. I, I, I really enjoyed At Dusk, actually. I enjoyed them both. They, um, they, t they somewhat talk about this, about, they talk about South Korea, about the industrialization and the capitalism, the type that was in South Korea and kind of the people who lost out and also the comparison be between the people who won and lost out. Uh, it's a bit more than a simple class struggle though because it, it brings in a lot of stuff about Korea, about Seoul, especially if you've been to Korea. I think you'll find a lot of tidbits here. Um, familiar things I thought was great because it brought up um, these the sort of Korean style fairies that come from Korean mythology and they kind of had uh, had a big part of the story as well. And so I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, but yeah, so this is in the long list to win the Man Booker International Prize for 2019. So that'll be interesting to see how that goes. Once again, the author's name is Hwan Sook Young. Once again, you can find a Wikipedia page for him, I'm sure, because uh, it's up there. So let's continue right on. I'm going to go and segue right into my favorite, Pavane for a Dead Princess. This was my absolute favorite book out of all these that I have here. I thought it was absolutely, absolutely excellent. Um, and I think it just struck a chord with me. I usually hate recommending books because the moment you recommend a book or you recommend anything, people, you know, the, your favorite book, your favorite movie, anything like that will never be something that someone highly recommended. It always be something you'd be like, oh, it might be okay. And then it turns out it was awesome by surprise. Uh, so, uh, you know, recommending something highly kind of dooms it in a way, but I'm still recommending it because there you go. I really liked it. I'm trying to find his other book. Here you go. This is his other book. But let's talk about Pavane for a Dead Princess. It was extremely good. What it did was, I mean, it, there's a whole storyline in and of itself, but it was also commentary on beauty. And I thought it was very interesting because every one of us, especially girls, and, and that's what I was talking about, are judged based on beauty. And it's very true, even if you're not in the beauty industry or anything like that, you are judged. Like you could have a person, you know, say a girl who is extremely good at math, who uh, you know was a, won an Olympic medal and is uh, really good at playing piano and is successful in all these things, but if she's ugly, you know people will be like, oh well, yeah, it's because she's so ugly, so she couldn't find a boyfriend. That's why she has time to do all these other things or something like that. And it's very you know right away you get judged based on beauty, um, no matter what your other accomplishments or, or the other things you do. And um, and this happens for both males and females, but obviously it's a lot more for females. And this addresses that, and I thought in a very beautiful way. Um, it is, uh, I mean, it's, it's a storyline, but that's kind of embedded in the story. I won't go into the story itself, but I really did like it a lot. Um, so if you get a chance, I recommend you look it up. By the way, you might have noticed a lot of the books that I'm mentioning have similar uh, format. That's because they're part of the Library of Korean Literature. I really love that they do this, by the way. Uh, they, uh, every now and then they release something in translation in English uh, by a famous Korean author, and a lot of them are excellent, I find. Um, and you'll find a lot of well-known stuff. Lee Moon Yol is, uh, is an author that I found out I like a lot. Um, I read this, Son of Man, and then I bought another book of his called The Poet, which is about um, 
uh, a real life person in the late 1800s in Korea who basically traveled around being a traveling bard, a traveling poet, kind of like a troubadour almost, and writing poetry. And then it talks about his life and it's quite interesting. And, but it's, it's very good to discover new authors through this Library of Korean Literature. Honestly, I just find these in used, either used bookstores or online. Uh, under Amazon, under used books. A books is a good place to find them. You know, any place where you can find uh, stuff like that, you can find these, or you can probably order them directly from Library of Korean Literature. I'm sure if you Google it, you can find out. Uh, but anyway, this was excellent. And this made me order another book of his called Dinner with Buffett. This was okay. I can't, I can't say I'd liked it nearly as much as Pavana for a Dead Princess. Uh, maybe I expected too much, but Pavana for a Dead Princess was excellent. By the way, you can find more of my reviews and everything I talk, I say uh, on my Goodreads account, which obviously I'll link to. Let's see, I'm trying to go through these kind of quickly. I don't have to go through all of them. Um, and uh, if you have any specific questions, you can ask me. I'll do one more because I thought this was interesting. Yi Inhua. Uh, I feel bad doing because there are a lot of, there's some that are considered classics. Anyway, this was historical fiction. And to me, it was the one that uh, reminded me most of Umberto Eco, like Name of the Rose or something like that. Because it, in fact, you have a murder mystery and, uh, and it takes place in, uh, in uh, well, this one takes place in the 1700s, I believe, during the Chosen Dynasty. And it talks about intrigue. It has a lot of real people in it and uh, it talks about basically a turning point during the Chosen Dynasty and what was going on. And, uh, and they're trying to solve the murder in the meantime. And, and uh, it's, it, it, I thought it was excellent. I really liked it a lot. Um, and uh, you probably need to know a bit about Korean history, probably more than I know about Korean history, because I was getting quite confused. Uh, but it's kind of the same with Umberto Eco. Like he goes into more, like he doesn't dumb anything down. And I don't think he did either. And I appreciated that. So um, if you can find it, it's called Everlasting Empire by Yi Inhua, who he is, um, he's an author, he's also a professor. Although I heard recently, I might have this wrong, but I heard recently he, uh, he was kicked out or fined or even arrested for something. But anyway, he was a professor for a long time and it doesn't take away from the fact that this book was very good. So uh, feel free to look it up. So let's end this off with uh, two books that I really liked, uh, two ones that I gave five stars to. One is The Library of Musical Instruments by uh, Kim Jung Hyuk. Kim Jung Hyuk, um, um, by the way, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing these words, which I'm sure I am. I thought this book was great. It's a collection of short stories. Um, they're all based on kind of musical instruments that are supposed to combine to do this whole like orchestra ensemble. Um, and one of the stories is called Library of Musical Instruments, but the whole book is constructed that way. And it's all kind of experimental. Like one of them, uh, one of the stories takes the first sentence and the last sentence of a popular novel, but he recreates his own novel in the middle, which I thought was extremely interesting. Um, and I, in fact, I'd like to, I think that would be a, an excellent experiment for, you know, English class for English teachers out there or something. Anyway, uh, this was uh, very good. Uh, Kim jong Hyuk. I read another book by him, a short book, a novella called The Glass Shield, which was a bit too weird for me. Uh, but I, I enjoyed it. It was just, I'm sure there was a lot of symbolism that was over my head. But um, this one was, was great. You can feel free to look it up, Library of Musical Instruments. And uh, let's get into the next one. And here we have No One Writes Back by Zhang Eunjin. Um, I know very little, you know, which means nothing about her. In fact, I think this was the only translated work I found of hers. But uh, regardless, I really enjoyed this. Uh, this is uh, one story. It's not a collection of short stories. Uh, it's about a guy who travels around with his dog and just writes to people. But he writes, he doesn't write using their name. He writes using their numbers. In the order in which he met them, he just keeps writing to them and maintains a correspondence. I know it sounds really weird and a bit off, but it's actually really cool. Let's see what it says, because I read it a while ago. Communication and lack thereof is the subject of this sly update of a picaresque novel. No one writes back is the story of a young man who leaves home with only his blind dog, an MP3 player, and a book, traveling aimlessly for three years from motel to motel, meeting people on the road. Rather than learn the names of his fellow travelers or even invent nicknames for them, he assigns them numbers. There's 239, who once dreamed of being a poet, but who now only reads her poems to a friend in a coma. There's 109, who rides trains endlessly because of a broken heart, and 32, who, do, anyway, you get the idea. And that's a much better description than the one I gave. I probably should have just been reading the back covers of all of these. Anyway, here's another one. No one writes back. Feel free to look it up. If you would like to discuss any other 
of these books here, uh, feel free to let me know. There you go, just so, to give you a look. Oh, oh, oops. Or these ones as well. Uh, I guess I talked about these ones. And, um, but, and then I have other ones, like I said, back in Taiwan, and, or the digital ones that I read, and, and audiobooks. Uh, the Plotters I read, uh, an audio version. That was really cool, actually. That was more, uh, a bit more modern, I'd say. It was by Kim Unsu. Yeah, it had to do with uh, what, what they call plotters. It's basically, how do you call them? Lone gunman. I mean, the life of being a lone gunman and, uh, and a killer for hire. And it's, uh, it, it was pretty good, a action packed and stuff like that. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, but anyway, feel free to ask me if you have any questions about these. I don't want to ramble on too much, but I just kind of want to talk a bit about some contemporary Korean fiction that I've been reading lately and some of the authors that I've been enjoying because uh, I do enjoy quite a bit of these and I kind of try to be on the lookout for other books they might be writing or that I can find of theirs. Um, and, and this includes translators as well. Like I said, Sora Kim Russell is probably my favorite translator out there right now from Korean to English. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so it, it's good, I think, in general. And I wish they would get more recognition. You know, you, you, many, many times you don't even see their name on the cover, which kind of annoys me because they wrote the book for people like me who can't read in the original language. So in a way, we're reading their interpretation of the book. And I think it's tremendously important. Also, I'm a translator, so obviously I'm extremely biased. But all of you are translators as well, presumably, if you're watching this on my channel. So we can all be biased together. Um, and, I mean, I've got stuff I could mention about the other ones, but I, uh, I, I'm, I just keep dragging on and on and on and on and on, and it wouldn't be any fun for anyone. So I'm going to leave it there. If you do have any questions, feel free to let me know. If you want me to talk about any other type of literature, let me know. Uh, I know earlier on I talked about some translated literature and you guys seem interested in it. In it. Uh, then later I talked about just biographies and you guys were not interested in it at all. So presumably translated literature is something you're more interested in. But, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Otherwise, enjoy your holidays and I will be back to you when I will be back to you because I'm going on holidays too. I will have another video at some point soon. Otherwise, I'll talk to you when I talk to you. Okay, bye. Sabidum.